This is the 19th video in our series on abstract algebra. And today we're going to start talking about something called ideals and quotient rings. But let's motivate that a little bit. And we'll start with the following definition. So given a subring S of a ring R, the coset of S in R with representative little r is defined to be the following object, which should look familiar from when we were dealing with cosets of groups. So we have little r plus s. So that's going to be a set made up of the form everything little r plus s as this little s ranges through the entire subring s. So we'll of course look at examples of this, but that's this definition of a coset. Now I'd like to make a couple of quick remarks before we move on to forging this into something called an ideal. So even though rings have two operations, addition and multiplication, the cosets are always with respect to addition. And then also, since R with addition is an abelian group, then if we view everything as a group, S is a normal subgroup of R. And that's because any subgroup in the setting of an abelian group is a normal subgroup. But if you've got a normal subgroup, then immediately R mod S makes sense. The quotient group R mod S makes sense, where the operation is addition. And that leads us to the following really important question is, what condition do we need on S, the subring, so that R mod S is a ring itself? So like we noted over here, addition is already okay. So that means all we need is to make sure we have a well-defined multiplication. So we would probably like to define the multiplication like this. So maybe we'll write that as we want to define a multiplication so that a plus s times b plus s equals a times b plus s. So that would be the easiest way to define a multiplication. But like I said before, we need this to be well defined. And by that, we need this not to depend on the coset representative. Okay, so let's see exactly what that means. So what if we have equality of cosets? So A plus S is the same thing as C plus S, and B plus S is the same thing as D plus S. Then, it shouldn't matter which version of the cosets we multiply together in order to give us the same answer. Okay, so in other words, what we want to get out of this is A, B plus S must be equal to C, D plus S. But let's recall that we've got a lot of results about equality of cosets for groups and we can use those here where our group operation is addition. So let's notice that this right here will tell us that A minus C is an element of S. That's from that big result on coset equality just applied here to the additive group, you know, R. Okay. And then similarly, we'll have B minus D is an element of S from this right here. Okay, but then that tells us that A minus C equals S1 and B minus D equals S2, where S1 and S2 are elements of S. So it'll be helpful to do this so that we can maybe do everything at the level of elements which is maybe less efficient, but more illuminating when we're getting used to this setting. Okay, but now let's rewrite this a little bit. This means that A is equal to C plus S1, and then B is equal to D plus S2. And now let's take the product of A times B and the product of C plus S1 and D plus S2. Well, those are the same products. 
So let's maybe put this as like an observation. Let's notice that in fact, A plus B is equal to C plus S1 times D plus S2. And now we'll distribute this out, keeping in mind that we do not necessarily have commutativity of multiplication. So we'll have C times D plus C times S2. That's from moving this C onto both of those terms. And then we'll also have S1 times D and then plus S1 times S2. And then let's recall what it would take for these two cosets to be the same. And let's point out that we do not have this yet. This is what we want to show. But for those two cosets to be the same, we would need AB minus CD to be an element of S, just by that coset equality theorem that we use over and over and over again. So let's take this equation right here, which we have built, and let's express it as, you know, AB minus CD equals a bunch of other stuff. So we'll have AB minus CD is in fact equal to CS2 plus S1D plus S1S2. And then let's notice that some of this is already inside of S. So this S1 times S2 is an element of S given that S is a subring. But these two are not necessarily elements of S for an arbitrary subring. So we want these to be elements of S and that'll make this whole right hand side an element of S. So let's maybe do this in a slightly different color. So we want these two to be elements of S. Okay, so that means that what we really need to occur is for C times S2 and S1 times D to be elements of S. So in other words, if we right multiply something by an element of S and left multiply something by an element of S, we should end up in S. And that's in fact the condition that we will need in order for this quotient to be a ring. And that condition will be called being an ideal. Okay, so now that we've motivated this condition, let's write that definition on the board over here and then explore some examples. So summarizing that condition we got on the last board leads us to the following definition. So given a ring R and a subring, which we'll call I, we say that I is a left ideal if for all little r in R, little r times I is a subset of I. But that's like the way of writing it as a subset condition, but usually it's a little bit easier to write it or a little bit easier to come to grips with it when you're learning this stuff with an element condition. So that's equivalent to saying that little r times little i is an element of i for all i in capital I. And then we've got another definition for a right ideal. And that says that this is a right ideal if for all little r in r, i little r is a subset of i. But again, if we want to write that in an element-wise setup, we would have i, little i times r is an element of i for all i in i. And then we say it's an ideal or sometimes a two-sided ideal if it's both a left and a right ideal. And in that case, the set of cosets r mod i is in fact a ring and that's called the quotient ring. And the addition and the multiplication are exactly what you want. So a plus i plus b plus i is a plus b plus i. So that's at the level of Belian groups, so that shouldn't be like any problem at all. And then this structure of the ideal means that the multiplication is well-defined as we discussed earlier. And so that we have a plus i times b plus i is a times b plus i. So coset multiplication makes sense in this case. Okay. So now let's look at some examples, starting with a very basic one. NZ is an ideal of Z. 
Okay, so we can check this really easily. So this is a sub ring. That's pretty easy to check. I won't do that. Let's check that it has this, these ideal properties. Since this is commutative, we only have to check one of them because there are no left and right ideals inside of commutative rings. There are only two-sided ideals. Okay, so let's suppose that we've got some sort of arbitrary element of Z, maybe we'll call it M. So M is an element of Z, and then we've got an arbitrary element of NZ. But an arbitrary element of NZ is just a multiple of N, so we'll call that AN, which is in NZ. And now let's look at the product of those two. So just to reiterate, we're taking the product of an element of the ring with an element of the ideal, and we should end up in the ideal. That's what's happening over here. An element of the ring times an element of the ideal is inside of the ideal. An element of the ideal times an element of the ring is inside of the ideal. That's the special condition here. Okay, so we've got M times AN. Well, that's going to be equal to maybe very clearly MA times N, but that's clearly a multiple of N, so that is within NZ. Now, if we were to do this on like a specific example, which isn't a terrible idea, let's say 6z is an ideal of z. Okay, and then let's do this on some example elements. So this will not prove that it's an ideal. Well, we already proved it's an ideal up here in general. It just exhibits the ideal condition. So let's take an arbitrary element of z. So for instance, the number 15 is an element of z. And then let's take some sort of random element of 6z. So that's got to be a multiple of 6. So for instance, 12 is an element of 6z. And now let's take their product. So 15 times 12 well, that can be rewritten as 15 times 6 times 2, but that's equal to 30 times 6. Oh, but notice 30 times 6 is clearly equal to 180, but that's an element of 6z because it's a multiple of 6 by our expression above. So that doesn't, like I say, prove that 6z is an ideal. We did that up here in general. That just like kind of exhibits the ideal relationship. Okay, so now let's do some example calculations in the quotient ring. So the quotient ring here is z mod 6z, which we know as a group is isomorphic to z6. We don't yet know that it's isomorphic to z6 as a ring, although we know that z6 is a ring but we will prove that later once we know something about the isomorphism theorem for rings. That's maybe the easiest way to do this. Okay, so let's notice for instance that five plus six z times five plus six z is equal to 25 plus six z by the definition of the operation. And now we need to reduce that to maybe some which is contained in the typical set of cosets which defines z mod 6z, which would be like 0 plus 6z, 1 plus 6z, 2 plus 6z, 3 plus 6z, and then 4 plus 6z, and then finally 5 plus 6z. So that would be the typical full list of cosets of z mod 6z. So which one is that? Well, I think you can probably immediately see that it's 1 plus 6z, but let's spell that out. So notice that this is equal to 1 plus 24, but 24 is the same thing as 6 times 4. So we have this is 1 plus 6 times 4 plus 6z. But then we're going to use the fact that 6 times 4 is a multiple of 6 and then absorb it into 6z. So that means after this absorption we have this 1 plus 6z. And this is a fairly typical way of doing this. Let's do another example. Let's maybe do 3 plus 6z times 4 plus 6z.
Okay, so multiplying those will give us 12 plus 6z. But then 12 is inside of 6z, so we can absorb it inside of 6z, leaving us 0 plus 6z. So those are some example calculations inside of this quotient ring. But I'd like to point out that this means that these two are in fact zero divisors because their product, because their product was zero whereas neither of them were zero. And then this product right here tells us that these two, well, they're the same number or they're the same element, are units. In fact, that is its own inverse because their product was equal to the multiplicative identity. Okay, so let's do another example. For our next example, let's take the ring to be the ring of polynomials with integer coefficients. And then we'll take the ideal to be all polynomials that have degree two or higher. So just as like an example, what are some elements in here? So notice that x squared plus 3x cubed is an element of this ideal. Maybe x to the fifth plus 12x to the seventh is an element of that ideal and so on and so forth. And here I've written like an arbitrary element of this ideal. It starts at a2x squared a3x cubed all the way up to a n x to the n. So here n has to be bigger than or equal to 2 because we're starting at a squared term and those a i terms have to be integers it's just given the fact that we're inside of z adjoint x. Okay so let's check that this is an ideal. So let's take maybe f of x from z adjoint x and then we'll take g of x from i. And we're going to use this little fact here, which, you know, I don't believe that we really need to prove. And that says that the degree of f of x times g of x is equal to the degree of f of x plus the degree of g of x. And so just as a quick reminder, what's the degree? Well, the degree is the largest power of x that we see. So that means the degree here is equal to 7 because that's the largest power of x we see. Here, the degree is 3 because that's the largest power of x we see. And so now let's take the product of f and g, but we want that product to be inside of i. But in order to be inside of i, we need to measure its degree. So let's do that. So let's notice that the degree of f of x times g of x, well, I'm essentially going to rewrite this again, is equal to the degree of f of x plus the degree of g of x. But the degree is always bigger than or equal to 0. So degree zeros are constants. Degree 1 would end at x and so on and so forth. So this is bigger than or equal to the degree of g of x because, like I just said, the degree is always bigger than or equal to 0. So the degree of that is bigger than or equal to 0. So if I drop it, I get something bigger than or equal to. But since g of x is inside of i, and i contains only polynomials of degree 2 and higher, we know that the degree of g of x is in fact bigger than or equal to 2. So this is bigger than or equal to 2. And that's because g of x is in i. But that's exactly the condition to be inside of i. So the degree of the product is bigger than or equal to 2, meaning that this product is inside of i because it's like found the condition to be inside of i. Now that we've done that, let's do an example calculation inside of z adjoin x mod i. So in other words, inside of this quotient ring. Okay, well let's first start by simplifying some sort of polynomial coset. So let's look at the polynomial x cubed plus 3x squared plus 5x minus 7 plus i. So that coset. But let's notice that everything up here is an element of i because those two terms have degree bigger than or equal to 2. So that means we can take those two terms 
and absorb them into the ideal, giving us this coset equality that this is equal to the coset 5x minus 7 plus i. So there we did that quick absorption in order to show that we had got a simpler coset. Now you could of course go back to that coset equality theorem and say that the difference in those two is equal to this thing that I've overlined in green, which is an element of I. So that means that those two cosets are equal. But this absorption is like a quicker way of doing that. Okay, so notice that this means that everything or all of the cosets can be written like this. So all cosets will equal ax plus b plus i. That's because you can always take those higher terms and absorb them into i. Okay, so now let's do maybe a general, yet an example calculation of a product inside of this quotient ring. Let's take ax plus b plus i, so that coset, and let's multiply it into the coset cx plus d plus i. So that's as arbitrary as a multiplication that we need to think about because all the cosets can be simplified like we described before. Okay, so this is gonna be equal to, well, let's see, it'll be acx squared plus ad plus bc times x plus b, d, and then plus the ideal. That's just from foiling out those two things here. Okay, but then we can take all of the portions that have degree bigger than or equal to two and absorb them into the coset. So that's an element of i, I should say absorb them into the ideal. So that's an element of i, so we can absorb it into the ideal, leaving us with the following object, ad plus bc times x plus bd, and then plus i. So that would be maybe the simplest product of these two objects. Okay, so now I wanna introduce like a little bit more notation that we're not gonna use so much, but you can use for simplification. And that is sometimes we would take this coset, ax plus b plus i, and rewrite it as ax plus b with an overline. And maybe we would read that as like ax plus b bar. And that's just maybe a shorthand for saying that we're passing to the quotient. Okay, so now that we've done that, I wanna look at a way of building new ideals from old ideals. So in order to make some new ideals from old ideals, we need some definitions. And so let's say we've got a ring R and we've got two ideals of R, which are I and J. Then we can define their sum, which we'll call I plus J, to be everything of the form little i plus little j, where little i is an i and little j is in j. So that's the sum of two ideals. And then we could define their product similarly, although not exactly the same as we'll see. So the product i times j will be all finite sums of products of elements. So in other words, it'll be like i1, times j1 plus i2 times j2 up to in times jn, where all of the iks come from i and all of the jks come from j. And you might ask, well, why do we need this sum? Why couldn't it just be everything of the form i times j? Well, without this sum built into the game, we don't get a new ideal. In fact, we don't get a new subring. And being a subring is necessary for being an ideal. And we can show that with the following example. Let's take the ring Z adjoin X and we'll take the ideal to be all polynomials where the constant term is even. So this is gonna be everything of the form 2a0 plus a1x up to a n x n, where all of those ai's are integers. And this two ensures that the constant term is even. And for the product, we'll just take two copies of i and we'll denote that by i squared. So let's notice that two and x are both elements of i. But that means four and x squared are both elements of i squared. But if we do not allow sums here, 
then x squared plus four, the sum of these two, will not be an element of i squared. And that's because you can't factor this thing. This polynomial does not factor over the integers. But that means without these sums, we would not have closure under addition. But if we don't have closure under addition, we're not even a subring in the first place, which means we can't even start to be an ideal. So now let's do the following proposition. So, and that will be that I intersect J, I plus J, and I times J are all ideals. And notice really the first thing that we should check here is that they are all sub rings. But I'm actually going to let you check that as a little exercise. I think that's fairly easy to check and it makes a good exercise. So let's show that they're ideals. Okay, so let's suppose that we have R an element of R and we have A an element of I intersect J. But notice that that means that A is an element of I and A is an element of J. That's the definition of intersection. But since A is an element of I, we have AR and RA are both elements of I. That's because we're assuming I is an ideal. And then since A is an element of J, that means that AR and RA are both elements of J. That's again because we're assuming that J is an ideal. But now patching these two things together, we see that AR and RA are elements of I intersect J, but that's exactly the condition that we need for I intersect J to be an ideal. So we're good to go there. Okay, so now let's look at I plus J, the sum. And maybe before we continue on here, I'd like to point out that these types of ideals will play an important role when we go over the isomorphism theorems for rings. Okay, so let's do it. Let's suppose that R is an element of R and we have A an element of I plus J. But notice that means that A has a special form. It's little i plus little j, where little i is i, and little j is in j. And now we can just let it rip. So let's notice that A times R is i plus j times R. But now we can do distribution to give us IR plus JR. But now notice that's going to be an I plus J. Because IR is an I and JR is in J because those are both ideals themselves. Now we can do the other sided multiplication, RIA. So that'll be R times I plus J but that's gonna be equal to Ri plus Rj. But again, that's gonna be an I plus J for the same reason. Because Ri is an I because we have I is an ideal and Rj is in J because J is an ideal. So these two conditions tell us that we have an ideal I plus J and we're good to go. So now let's do our last one, which is this product I times J. So let's again get started. Let's suppose that R is an element of R and we have A is an element of I J, but that means that A has the form at I1 J1 added all the way up to I N J N. Okay, good. But now let's look at each of these. We have A times R, so that'll be I1 J1 plus all the way up to I N J N times R. But now we can do our distribution rule again, and that'll leave us with I1 J1 times R, and I'm gonna associate it like that, plus all the way up to I N and then J N times R but I'm gonna argue that this is inside of I, J. And let's color code the argument. That's because I1 up to I, N are all in I, you know, by sort of our definition up here. I didn't write that, but that's because all of these I, Ks are in I, and all of these J, Ks are in J, like our definition over here. 
But now we can use the fact that J is an ideal. And since J is an ideal, all of these things right multiplied by R into the J term are inside of J. So that's because J is an ideal. Okay, so we've got A times R is an IJ. So that's one portion of the ideal condition we need. And now let's look at R times A. So that'll be R times I1, J1, add it all the way up to I N, J N. But that'll be, let's see, R, I1, J1, add it all the way up to R, I N, J N. But I'll argue that that's in I, J very, very similarly. So notice that all of the J's are inside of J by you know, our original assumption. And then by this property that we had before for ideals, we know that Ri1 is an element of I, all the way up to Rin is also an element of I because I itself is an ideal. So we've got Ar is an Ij and Ra is an Ij, but that's exactly the condition we need for Ij to be an ideal. So in fact, we do have an ideal, finishing this proof. We'll finish this video off with a new type of ideal or a really special type of ideal that shows up a lot in the examples that we'll see. And that's something called a principal ideal. So we'll mostly do this in the setting of commutative rings with identity. But I will point out a remark of what happens if you're outside of that setting. So if R is a commutative ring with one, and A is an element of R, then the principal ideal generated by A is, put very simply, all multiples of A. So you write this as these parentheses with the A, or sometimes they're like square brackets with the A, or angle brackets with the A, I should say. And that's gonna be, like I said, all R multiples of A. So we've got A times R as R runs through everything from the ring. Here we're assuming commutativity, so that means A times R is R times A, so we don't have to worry about that. And then also we're assuming we have a one. So we will uh, eventually choose the element one here, which means A will be inside of this. Sometimes this is written as little a r, just for interest. And then here's our remark. If R is non-commutative or it does not contain one, the situation is a little bit more complicated. And in this case, maybe the maybe most universal way of defining this principal ideal is to be the smallest ideal containing the element A. But what does that mean? Well, one way of getting at it is to intersect all ideals that contain A, and that'll give you the smallest one. But like I said, we'll most, mostly be dealing with this up here. Now, it's pretty simple to show that principal ideals are in fact ideals, so I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Okay, so now let's prove the following proposition as maybe our last thing for the day before I leave you with some warm-ups. And that is that every ideal of Z is principal. And the rings that have this characteristic are called principal ideal domains or PID or PIDs. So what we're showing here is that Z is a PID. Okay. So how can we do this? Well, let's start with an ideal. So let's let I, a subset of Z, be an ideal. So that means it's a subring with that absorption property. And now let's notice that since I is an ideal, let's maybe say it's non-trivial. So let's say that I is not just the element zero. But if I is not just the element zero, it must contain positive as well as negative elements. That's because anything will come with its additive inverse given that it is a subring. So since it has positive elements, it intersects non-trivially with the natural numbers. And that's what we want to use here. So let's set this number in equal to the minimum of the intersection of n with the natural numbers. So like I said, that'll be a non-empty subset of the natural numbers. And we know every non-empty subset of the natural numbers has a minimal element. And we're just taking that minimal element. That's by the well-ordering principle. Great. 
And now let's observe that since n is an element of i, well, it's most definitely an element of i because you know we're setting it equal to the minimum here. And like I said, by the well-ordering principle, subsets of natural numbers achieve their minimum. Um, we have m times n is n i for all integers m. That's because i is assumed to be an ideal. So since it's assumed to be an ideal, it has this absorption property like I talked about. But notice that everything of this form, well, that's creating everything in the principal ideal. So that means that, in fact, the principal ideal generated by n is a substructure, a subset of the whole ideal. And I'd just like to point out that we'll generally write this principal ideal as nz, although sometimes it's written as n, so it's no big deal either way. Now we'd like to show this subset containment the other way. Okay, so let's suppose that a is an element of i, and we'll do the division algorithm with a and n. So as is somewhat common, it comes down to division with remainder, something you learned many, many years ago. Okay, so what is that gonna give us? That'll give us a equals n times q plus r, where q is an integer, r is also an integer, but r is between n, sorry, between zero and n. It's allowed to include zero, but not n. That's by the division algorithm. So now let's rewrite some things. We can write r is equal to a minus n q. And notice we took a to be an element of i. That was our assumption right here. And then, since n is an element of i as well, we know any multiple of n is also an element of i because it's an ideal. Essentially using the same argument we had here. But then since i is a subring, the difference of two elements of the ideal is an element of the ideal. So we've got this as an element of the ideal. But look, there are two possibilities r could either be equal to zero or it could be smaller than the smallest possible positive element of i. But it can obviously not be smaller than the smallest positive element of i because that would be a contradiction. So that means by those words that I just said that r equals zero. But now, looping that back into this equation right here, we have a is equal to nq, which is an element of the principal ideal generated by n by the definition of the structure of the principal element or principal ideal generated by n. So what does this tell us? This tells us that i is a subset of the principal ideal generated by n. But that means we've got the subset relationship going both ways, which means that the ideal is really just this principal ideal generated by n, meaning that since we started with an arbitrary ideal, ended with a principal ideal, every ideal of z must be principal. Okay, now I'm gonna leave you with some warm-ups. Here are three nice warm-up exercises based off of what we've seen. So the first is to consider the principal ideal generated by the quadratic polynomial x squared plus 3x minus 1. So just as a reminder, that's going to be everything of the form x squared plus 3x minus 1 times another polynomial p of x, where p of x is in z adjoint x. That's our parent ring here. And then let's simplify the following product inside the quotient ring. So we've got x squared plus 7x plus i, that's the coset, and then x minus 3 plus i. So do that product and then simplify. Then for the second one, we've got kind of a three-part thing, and that is using the fact that all of the ideals in z are principal. So let's find a natural number n such that n is equal to the sum of the ideals generated by 6 and 15. Or the second one is n is the product of the ideals generated by 6 and 8. Or finally, n is the intersection of the ideals generated by 6 and 8. So I think those are all pretty interesting.
And then finally, let's set S equal to all Gaussian integers where the real part is even. So in other words, we've got everything of the form 2a plus bi where a and b are integers. Then next, let's show that S is a subring but not an ideal. And that's a good place to stop.